can should be like this. Hello, everyone. So after a short break, we are back. So we are back for another episode of the Swiss Tech Vision series. I know that for some it will sound a bit redundant, but let's just have a quick word to remind you that this weekly series of talks about vision and visual neuroscience are part of the World Rhino Institute. WWM is a platform for neuroscientists in various fields to exchange on their more recent work. And I have to say that up until now, it has been a great way to exchange with your peers while traveling to conferences was still difficult. So we hope that uh, this kind of talks will remain a regular practice in the future. I mean, only the future will tell. Anyway, uh, I'm Maxim uh, from a PhD in Tom Baden's lab. And today I'm very glad to receive Maximilian Dorsch from IST Austria, the Institute of Science and Technology in Vienna. Maximilian started uh, studying astronomy at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Santiago in Chile. And later he moved to Tumigen and Munich to finish a degree in biochemistry. He then obtained his PhD in a laboratory of Alexander Bors at the Max Planck Institute for Neurobiology in Munich. And then he worked as a postdoctoral fellow with Mark Meister and Joshua Sens at Harvard University. Now, Maximilian is an assistant professor at the Institute for Science and Technology in Austria. And there he leads a research team focused on understanding the neuronal basis of visual transformations and their role in instructing innate behavior. So we're very happy to receive him today, and we are really looking forward to hear about his panoramic view on vision. So, hello, Maximilian. How are you doing today? Hello, Maxim. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, uh, first, um, shall I share my screen, or how shall we start? It is yours. You can go ahead. Excellent. Share the screen. Can you tell me if you see everything fine? I see your presenter mode. Okay, should be a white screen. So, um, hello Sorry, everybody. I don't see your full screen. You don't see my full screen. Let I see your presenter mode. Let me see. Oh. Back again. What about now? Better. You can. <laughs> Thank you. So um, hello everybody. Um, it's difficult always. I'm not used, still not used to talk to um, a non-audience, but um, I I have to start by saying a few words on something that's completely unrelated to the work we're doing in the lab, and it's because um, of what's happening on a world stage. And um, and it's I know for many people that are affected have the families, um, including in my lab. Um, where you, the morning discussions is, um, how is your family doing and they're still alive? So um, with that, I would just say that um, please support everybody who is now in, um, going through this hardship and let's, um, as somebody who is much smarter than me once said, um, let's hope for genuine peace and the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living. And um, yeah, um, um, I just wanted to say those words because they were important to me. Um, okay, let's let's go jump from here on to science, and um, and we'll try to be um, um, on uh, as excited as I can, given the situation of something that I find um, um, really neat that we've been doing in the lab in the past couple of years, and it's a study that combines theory and experiments and some new um, low tech development that might be useful for the community. And so the story that I'm going to tell you today is about basically reflected in this picture. And I chose this picture, one, because I think it's beautiful, second, because it's my dog, and third, because you see the most relevant parts of what I wanna talk to you about. So um, you can clearly see the horizon, you can clearly see the difference in statistics on the sky and the ground and the luminance. And so the, the entire um, talk today will be to try to address to what extent these features, these statistical features, might have shaped the efficiency or the way our visual system might encode our panoramic surround. Um, I'm going to start first by um, introducing the team um, who did the work. This is um, Divyanch. Um, let me just see. Uh, um, pointer, please wonder. Divyanch, um, Gupta, Viktor Milyansky, Olga Simonova, and Jan Svan. 
This, this work is just recently um, um, published by archive. So um, if you're interested, you can look at all the details um, over there. I know that this lab and um, is um, well um, aware of how the retina works, but I don't know if all of the audience is. So I want to start giving a very quick introduction on, on which part of the visual system we're working on, which is the retina. And so um, the vertebrate retina is divided into, let's say, three gross stages. One would be the photoreceptors. You have three types of photoreceptors in the mouse retina that in sent, sends um, light and, um, and send this information to a very complex circuitry of hundreds of different cells. But roughly, you can think of it as do you have some direct bipolar cells that excite the, the retinal ganglion cells and a, a whole set of different amacrine cells that are inhibitory and sculpture um, the information that comes from the photoreceptors to send a particular information to the brain via this retinal ganglion cells. The study today will focus on the response properties of these retinal ganglion cells in the retina, basically the message that is being sent from the eye to the brain. Why? Because we think this is a good relay where we can perhaps start looking at differences and adaptations to the statistics I was mentioning to you at the beginning. And so what about this retinal ganglion cells? What do we know about this? Um, well, there are a lot of different types of ganglion cells, as here very beautifully shown in the study by their morpho morphologists. And so you have like the small ones, the bigger ones with asymmetries, you have very big ones and, and so on. Each of those can be genetically defined, has some, um, you, can, um, you can also physiologically define them by the response properties to light stimulus. For example, this would be a local edge detector. This might be more sensitive to color, opponency. Others might be insensitive for motion, et cetera, luminance, or whatever you, you, you think might be important to basically um, 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 divide the visual channels into how people think of it, um, streams of information. This idea, um, in addition to the fact that each of those independently, independently pile the retina, as you can depict here in one beautiful review from Rich Masland, is that each of those, perhaps this um, small LED and LED cell cells will basically um, have the receptive, the dendritic fields organized in such a way that um, the uniform basically sample across the, the retina space. And you have that also for the bigger ones as here. Let's say this would be the blue ones. And they're also basically homogeneous sample. And the idea is that overall, um, these cells will, base, will, will send each spot and position in space will send information um, to the brain, having all possible um, streams of information um, 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 there to be read out. So this is one way of seeing this, this entire story. But as I was telling you before, and there are strong asymmetries in the statistics of natural scene. These were studied in more detail recently last year in some work from the Euler lab on, from Hiroki Asari, where they tried to basically match um, um, how the mouse, and now all the work we're doing in mouse, but exactly how the mouse would perceive the, the world and how the statistic will change. And as the image that I was showing you before, what you see there is that there's a strong change in luminance if you're looking at the ground, there's a strong change of a gradient of luminance if you look up at the sky um, as depicted over here or over there. And there is this very crisp line on, on average that you can find in, in, on the horizon. So we said, if the system should efficiently encode um, um, the natural work, perhaps it takes this into account to shape the way the retinal ganglion cells might be um, relaying information to the brain. So the question we were asking right now is how all of those channels would be modified such that um, you efficiently basically match those statistics. But um, this is kind of a challenge because I was telling you that each of those different um, um, ganglion cell types, for example, the small ones might be important for edge detectors, this one for direction selectivity and so on. But we don't know, this is basically matching some functional response properties of a particular type. So we said, is there any, let's say, a more general way of describing it? And let's go a little bit old time, how people were describing those cells. More. And they were describing by some aspect, which would be their center surround receptive field. What is that? What is a center surround receptive field? Well, um, you can see it over here. Um, the idea of it is that um, the center of the receptive field will be the input that it gets directly to the dendritic field 
whereas the surround, which is basically um, depicted here by the, by the bigger donut, will be um, the information that these cells integrate via this amacrine inhibitory surrounds, shaping the way these cells respond. The most classical way of doing it, this would be one example of one cell. This would be an off-center depicted here. If you simulate on the dendritic field, it spikes, whereas it has a very strong um, antagonistic surround. When you have an analyst basically only exciting it here, it will spike when it's off. A different way of describing this phenomenon would be using spatial filters. And that's what you see here. Basically, it's for the same cell. You have here the blue part, which would be blue, meaning it, it spikes when the light goes off and has a particular shape. Whereas the surround of this would be red, and that would be this, um, um, it, um, depicting when the light goes on, will be driving the cell more strong. And we will try to go use this feature of each of the ganglion cells that we have measured to basically ask to what extent um, they may, may match the statistics of natural cells. And this is something that has been done previously. And um, I want, and all our work is basically inspired by this work of um, predictive coding um, done by Srinivasan, Laughlin, and Dubs. And, um, and we implemented this normative model and expanded it such that we can actually ask the questions. And I'm going to first describe um, how we did it and what it can. So perhaps a way of thinking of our work would be a, a, a refreshed view on inhibition on the red. And to start describing this model, I want to first describe um, the efficient co coding theory. And efficient coding um, as formalized um, by, by Laughlin in the 80s um, is um, an intuitive description on how the stimulus has to match a response curve. And assuming here this particular box that you see over there, it will have a distribution of intensities. And so assuming now stimulus independent additive noise, um, an efficient way of neural coding is to maximize the stimulus response relationship that makes each of the possible response equally like. Basically, if you think here, if this would be the all intensity and this would be the response properties, you would like to have the sigmoidal curve so that it is efficiently um, relaying the information um, 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 at what a sensory neuron to the brain. Um, one implementation of this um, very classical idea would be the predictive coding idea. And, ah, and um, as Barlow said, um, this perhaps this is a very nice way of putting it. This could be a, a neat pack, packaging of information. It's like, it's the, the, the best way of how the system should be encoding information such that um, you um, use the um, resources um, efficiently. And so um, this is basically um, um, the, 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 um, the essence of the first step and implementation of that would be the predictive coding idea. And um, let's see, this would be basically the same thing as I was telling you before, you have the box, you have the distribution, it, mans it matches the stimulus response curve. Now imagine you have a different point where, um, um, and this will elicit a different um, distribution of inputs. Um, and here the stimulus response curve is not neatly representing the stimulus distribution. Um, and what um, we would like with the predictive coding hypothesis to match is that um, we shift this distribution such that it matches again the, um, the intensity and the stimulus response curve to be more efficient. How would you implement something like this? Well, first, um, you need to know that natural scenes have spatial correlations, meaning that the statistics at nearby points in space are similar. Then you could implement it with spatial filters. Um, for example, in this, the center, um, another center surround filter, in this example, the center would encode for the luminance um, of the scene, whereas the surround will encode for subtract the prediction um, of the spatial correlation that you would um, that you would um, um, expect to, to, to see based on natural statistics. And so um, one subtracted by the other would be basically one, the measurement subtracted by the prediction would be the predictive error. And that's what basically we would like to relay on. And one important point here is that all of that is dependent on the signal to noise ratio. So if you want to tune it, you have to shift the signal to noise ratio and it will become from one to the other such that it becomes more efficient to, to subtract. 
And so um, one way of formalizing this would be having um, a very simple encoding modeling, um, a model of a retinal ganglion cell. This is probably the most simple way of representing what happens in the retina. You have an image sensed by photoreceptors, you add noise, um, combined it with a, with a spatial filter, and um, you see what is the output. And now the whole um, game that we're playing here is to optimize numerically such that um, we, we, we reduce a cost function would be basically reducing the firing rate. So um, what this, I was telling you that noise is, a, is an important aspect um, of, of this and that by changing the noise, you would change the properties of the filter if you optimize. So what about noise in NATOS? One important aspect is to know is that um, there's a, a ton of intrinsic noise in, in, in cone photoreceptors. So at photopic levels, it seems to be that it's um, three orders of magnitude higher than what you would expect from broad vision. And so you can think also of um, this change of natural statistics here on azimuth elevation of luminance and contrast, also so some sort of signal to noise um, ratio across the natural panoramic scenery. And so this is basically the value that we're going to use to optimize um, um, the filters. In addition, we realize that there is this very clear and sharp change of, um, at the horizon, which makes a, a very clear asymmetry, which might also affect the way um, those receptive fields might, um, might be shaped. When you run the simulations, what you can see is that um, three aspects were clear. One, if you see here, if you change the signal to noise ratio, what you see is that um, the, the center surround relationship, the surround changes, um, the, um, the stronger the signal, to, the signal to noise, the stronger the surround. Another aspect is that the, the center size will change. The stronger the signal to noise, the smaller the center. And another prediction is the, is the symmetry. The actually, the stronger the symmetry you will have, the more asymmetric the receptive fields will become. So assuming that this um, predictive coding hypothesis um, is implemented, we should be able to see some of these aspects in, in, in the retina response. And just to summarize the same finding in, or the same hypothesis or prediction in, in, a, in, in a simpler way would be to think of it as um, ground the sky, the higher the, 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 the higher the cells are looking like or the ventral, the most ventral cells that look at, uh, at the most um, 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 higher point in space should have a stronger surround, whereas the surround should decrease and the centers are increased, whereas at some point in the horizon, you should see that this has symmetry. So now we have a model, we have a prediction, but what would we need to basically test it? And for test it, we would like in one particular retina to sample as many possible cells um, in, in ideally the entire retina. And um, we didn't have a two photo microscope to, to um, um, use for these recordings. Um, MEAs have different issues if you want to exactly know where you're recording from. So we thought perhaps we can, um, um, we had a, a neat idea, perhaps we can use it to, to, to solve this, this issue. And this neat idea is extremely simple. And so um, if you think of, let me just see, I have this thing here that is a little annoying. Just give me a second. There. So, um, so if you if you think of what has been done before, it's particularly here by Tom and, and, and during his postdoc and um, a beautiful work where you can see um, a character has response properties across thousands of different cells. With two photo microscope imaging and, and some issues on, 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 on wrinkles and so on, there we're scanning a real position in space across a retina. And so it required different retinas to have, let's say, an overall picture. Other people have done it with a little bit more, um, um, with bigger areas. This also works. But it was still small if you, if you were aiming to image, let's say, 40, 50% of the entire retina. And so, short story, um, long story short, basically, we could figure out a very simple way such that we can start imaging across um, large regions of the retina. And what you see here is just a response of particular retina, which we can later tile on. And what the, the size of this is around 1.4 millimeters. And so what is the trick? Why can we do this um, so, so easily? And the trick is um, remarkably simple. 
And so it's based on that most of the photoreceptors in uh, the cone photoreceptors uh, of the mouse are EV sensitive. And they have the absorption spectrum across, uh, around basically 400, uh, 370, 380. Normally, when we're using two photo microscopy, you use a very long wavelength to excite the system. However, it's so much energy that even the, the, the exponential decay that you don't see here will also activate. And so it's like, if we're already activating, why not just using a red indicator and shift the wavelength such that we can start imaging um, at longer wavelength with epifluorescence? And what we just do is a very simple epifluorescent um, microscope, which allows us to basically record for very long periods of time, very large um, fields of view. And I'm going to try to convince you that for ganglion cell recordings, stimulating UV light, it makes um, it is a, a, a great plus, and, um, um, and and it's very easy to 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 adapt. So how do we approach this? So we used a line that is a genetic line expressed in GRI gecko, specific in ganglion cells. So all of the cells that we expressed here are ganglion cells using the VGLUT3 um, line, VGLUT2, and we basically know that all of the cells are RBPMS positive, meaning that they are ganglion cells. But this line, even though just because of genetics, um, labels 40% of ganglion cells in a very specific way. So for example, this is a, is, is a um, staining for alpha cells. Just one type of alpha cell seem to be um, in our line. Um, and we can image those across a very big field of view. So this would be, for example, one example retina. What you see here depicted by this um, orange box would be one, one of the fields of view that I was showing you before. And we can basically tile the image here one, the other one two, the third one would be here in the middle. And then we can basically have a, a very large um, 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 perspective on retina coding. And that's what we need because the difference that we're looking at are, are uh, spatially um, um, at a very large extent. So can we respond, look at response properties? Of course, we can basically look at single cells. We see response for PDs. The other interesting thing is that we can record for very, very long periods of time if you record on one field of view. So um, we have recorded up to an hour and a half, if I'm incorrectly. I mean, there's some bleaching coming up, but the responses are still there. And um, in all of that, it is roughly 20 times cheaper than a classical two-photo microscope. And it spits out at least 50 times more data for retina recordings. Okay, so if you make the calculation, it's perhaps um, worth, um, worth um, trying it out. So what about response properties? Um, here's some classical response properties I've been seeing, like this is um, recording for, um, over here you see a direction selective cell um, um, simulated with a bar, um, bright bar. You see it's the on off responsiveness. This is basically like an alpha cells responding, um, disregarding the direct orientation of the stimulus. We can basically map direction selectivity and ask which are direction selectivities um, that we see, and we basically see the cardinal directions. But interesting, we can in one retina reproduce some very neat um, 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 findings that have been done in the past. For example, um, this work by Sabat all where they've been looking at how the direction selectivity is, is, is mapped. And this is just looking across the retina. And this is looking at the same data in one of the retina that we tell where you just only we're stimulating this just to see if our, our system allows us to uh, reproduce prior results. And um, this is not a, a quantitative statement, but it's more a qualitative statement that um, it seems to be, if you look at the crosses here and the crosses here, that they were changing the orientation depending on where they are in the retina. So it seems to be that this uh, at least allows us to reproduce this type of data. And for chirp responses, of course, um, this is also a classical way of, of looking at um, how um, the system is um, um, representing, how, how much the system is representing cell types. And even though we have 40% of the cells, and we believe that they're always the same 40% um, and genetic defined ones, we can very easily um, classify them um, based on, on these response properties only. So we have on, off, transient, on, transient, we have suppressed, suppressed by contrast. And even we see some of the some of the responses that we haven't been able to match with prior um, um, results um, that have been published. One thing that is a beauty error here, if you like to compare, and um, we realize after the fact, um, normally people use the this um, the frequency chirp first and then the, the intensity one, such this is basically inverted. 
Okay, so I, I hope that I can convince you that at least for, for the classical response properties, we can match um, with this very simple approach, um, redefine or reconstruct, uh, um, not reconstruct, um, 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 reproduce um, pre previous results. But we're not interested here in studying chirp responses or direction selectivity per se. We're interested in looking at receptive fields. And by looking at receptive fields, we also need to have a good assessment of the center response and the surround, which is tricky in a way that is parameterizable. And so what normally people do is basically use white noise stimulus to, um, to basically reconstruct those receptive fields. The issue with white noise stimulus is that if you have big checker, you don't have very good um, um, spatial resolution, but you have a very strong response. Then if you lose small checkers, you might um, have very good spatial responses, but many of the cells don't respond at all because you need to record for a very prolonged period of time. So basically we said, why not combining both ideas and um, having a big checker that's shifting in space. And that's thus that if, you are, if your cell receptive field is, is um, if your checkers are um, stimulate the centers around the same time, by shifting them, sometimes it will be exciting the center, sometimes in surround, and on average, you will have a, a nice representation. And that worked remarkably well. So now we have a method with our system to, to start reconstructing spatial temporal receptive fields in a, uh, in, in, in a ver very simple way. And so it doesn't matter where exactly the, the checkers are at the beginning, because they will be shifting randomly such that at each point they will have, they will be exactly on top of the center. And the size of this, um, of one of those checkers was decided such that to match roughly the size of uh, the, the smallest um, um, retinal ganglion cells. Okay, using this approach, um, we actually could um, um, reconstruct a zoo of receptive fields. We basically imaged an entire retinas, let's say nine, we have around 30,000 spatial temporal receptive fields. And in here, you can basically see some have this type of, um, I don't know, Gabor-like, some others don't have surround. So now those here have a very strong surround and some of them might have an asymmetric surround. You have a, a, whatever you want, you will find there. The nice thing is that this, the, the signal to noise is good enough such that we can use very simple difference of Gaussians to fit them and parameterize them. Because after when, when you have um, 30,000 cells, it's, um, it's, it, 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 you need to have some unbiased approach. And so over on top, you see basically some example data receptive, um, receptive for, from some of the cells that we recorded. And um, in the lower part, you will see the fit. And um, if we might make an R2, um, if we basically try to see what's the error, um, um, it is um, um, very much most of the cells um, seem to have a very good fit um, and, um, and such that we can start analyzing using this data set to analyze and ask if our uh, theoretical predictions actually hold. And so let me remind you what the theoretical predictions were. And so we said that um, the relative surround will depend on, um, uh, the relative center to surround strengths will depend on the position on the dorsal ventral axis in such a way that the more ventral you go, the stronger the surround is. Um, and then we, the other prediction would be that the center strength will be diminished. So the, the more ventral you go, the, the smaller the, cent, the sizes of the center will be. And the other prediction that we had is that there must be a particular position that is exactly there where the horizon should be, where um, on top of the horizon, you will have um, more signal to noise on the bottom less. And so you will have a very strong asymmetry happen. So let's see what the data says. So, this was our prediction. We used this um, receptive field to parameterization. And now we can look at um, the response that we measured. And so this is, on top, you will see um, all cells from nine retinas basically um, 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 aligned in, into the same coordinate axis. And, and what you can see is um, a gradient from um, ventral to dorsal, basically, um, uh, I'm sorry, for the for the um, um, relative surround strengths. And what you can basically mimic here from a little more purple, purple to green is that the strengths will diminish with respect um, um, to the position. So the more dorsal you come, the less surround you will see. Um, the sizes also for all cells here start to be bigger the, the more dorsal you, become, you come in this dorsal ventral axis. 
And when you ask for the surround, how strongly asymmetric the surround is, you will see a very, very clear stripe at this position. If this would be the optic nerve, these are the cells that we, we recorded, um, you will see a very strong um, asymmetric streak. And this is, if you plot this in the, um, not dorsoventral axis, but la nasal um, um, in, in, in basically on, on the horizon, you don't see any correlation. So it, beautifully, you can basically see that relationship in one single retina. And this is what we did here. We basically cluster each of the receptive fields of all cells in a particular bin and inverted the on one because we just want to see the relative change from, um, from center to surround. So on off uh, spatial filters are all, um, all gr grouped here at the same, um, in the same retina. So this is a response of one retina. And what you can clearly see is that there is a strong surround cell in, in the upper visual field. When you go dorsally, if you perhaps you can see it, the, the, um, the centers are get bigger. And over here you have the streak of very strong surrounds um, that are asymmetric. When we look at this, um, we basically stained by, by the S option. And then we can actually see exactly where we are in the, in, 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 in the retina. And we make a little box and ask how asymmetric these cells are. You will see how, how strongly the effect is. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is exactly where the streak is. And then most, and if this, this would be this, the, the number of cells that are basically pointing ventrally and would be here strongly asymmetric, where if you go a little lower, it's become less asymmetric if you go higher in this in the cells that are in this box. Basically, of course, you you, you might have some bias there depending on how you're sampling, but overall, um, there is this 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 directionality of asymmetry is gone. So if we reconstruct um, basically the streak and try to put it back into visual coordinates and ask um, all the cells that are actually very strongly asymmetric where the positioned and where they're looking at you basically see the, the horizon as what we would have expected from before. So now we, I, I can tell you that on population of cells, we can match our predictions. So the surrounds get bigger, the, 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 the more um, dorsal you get, the, um, the strengths of the surround, sorry, the centers go bigger, the, the more dorsal you get, the surrounds got stronger, the more ventral you get, and you have an asymmetric screen. So, um, then we would like to want to ask, so is it just because of, of particular neurons that are much more asymmetric? It's like a population of cells that might be appearing in, in exactly on the horizon or some cells that for whatever reason have, um, are, are have a very strong surround that is um, varying and that will basically um, overtake the entire um, responses. And so we said, okay, what way could be functionally classified as cells to ask if it's across cell types or is it just um, a, um, a property of a particular subclass. And so um, using the temporal filters that we had, we started saying, okay, perhaps we can use the central response, the central temporal response to classify cells. And we did so. And we basically classified them into 10 different types, um, which you can see here on the left, here is time and color code would be basically the temporal filters. And you see that there are different groups of, of responses. Some are off, some are biphasic, some are on, some are more sluggish, some are faster. And if we use those groups and ask where the receptive fields are, it seems to be that for some of them, they tile more or less, I mean, um, at least from how we sampled it. So there are not much overlap between those cell types of this particular clap. And whereas by others, you have a strong overlap. And for example, number eight seems to be having many more cells. And this is something as what we would expect. But it cleans indeed a little bit. And we can start asking, okay, for all those um, groups, some of them might be cell types that are specific. Some of them might be a mixture of cell types. How would those properties change across the dorsal ventral axis? And what you see here is basically the same thing as we saw in the entire population. Again, um, for the relative surround strengths, it becomes um, um, weaker, the dorsal will be good, the surround become bigger for, I'm sorry, the, the centers become bigger for all cells, and you have this very neat peak for most of the cells um, of the asymmetry at the horizon. So basically now I've, I've been telling you three things. First, that we have um, um, a model that has certain predictions, 
we um, establish a system to ask if these predictions hold, um, and then we um, we tested them. And until now, at least for for the parameters we have used, um, we see a very clear match, positive match. So you might ask, um, what are the mechanisms that could be in in happening to to make this um, gradient or make these differences so apparent? And one thing that we've been thinking of, we don't know if this is true, is basically the, the, the gradient of opposites. So in the mouse visual system and in most musculus visual system, you have um, um, three opsins, rods that are uniformly um, distributed. And you have um, S opsins, uh, cones that are basically more strong in vendor. There's a gradient on them as depicted here. And you will have also some green opsins, which are more um, 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 more prevalent in the in the dorsal retina, and so given this basic gradient that you will see on um, on the S options, it could be that for whatever reason you need uh, uh, more drive in these cells and in um, to to excite this around, such that you can start seeing the differences across um, um, across elevation. And so, why is this interesting? I think this is interesting because of the because it would be evolutionary a very simple way to adapt your visual system to the constraints of natural scenes, and there is evidence that something that might actually happen. And this is some old work um, um, and done by, um, 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 by by I don't know remember his first name, but Peichel's lab, and where he basically they look at the opsin distribution across um, different mice. And interesting, mice that live more in the prairie and they're basically a more open field, which would be most musculus or this other um, um, field mice, they have this very strong gradient of S opsin. But if you look at mice that are that that um, live in, in dense forests, these gradients are basically either gone, they have basically um, because there is no S opsin, or because the um, S opsin is uniformly um, distributed. And um, perhaps. That could be a mechanism to tune um, the, the visual system such that you match um, the response repeaters um, in a way to efficiently encode um, um, the, the natural surround. And one thing that I would like to discuss is that um, this will have also repercussions to how these cells might actually encode information. And I was telling you at the beginning that we, we as a field, um, think very much of each of those cell types as uh, ways of relaying a particular type of information. Would it be um, color opponency, direction selectivity, um, and so on. And so this is basically perhaps nicely um, described with a cell that I've been working during my postdoc for a long period of time, it's GRGC. And now I inverted everything such that um, ground is in the bottom and um, top is, would be the sky. And these cells have been described to have an asymmetric surround. And this asymmetric surround basically makes them become direction selective um, to a very particular set of stimuli. Um, of course, there are other, other properties um, that have in the ground, but each asymmetric cell will ha have a particular um, set of parameters where you stimulate them and you will elicit some direction selective response. And so now, if you look at the responses of all of those cells, suddenly all of the ganglion cells that we measured will have a particular and the streak and um, some particular asymmetry. And so here we clustered all the, the um, um, all the asymmetries the, for all cells. So where they're pointing towards. And what you see in colored would be the cells that are very uh, strongly asymmetric. And in gray, these are not asymmetric, but our match, our uh, basically our parameterization makes everybody have some asymmetry, but but there might be um, a very little because there are two Gaussians. So it might be very little asymmetric. But um, all the color ones are where the symmetry is very strong, it's just like what you expect from the GRGCs. And, and interestingly, uh, in the um, in ventral retina, you see some peaks of asymmetry too, but these are matching to all four cardinal directions. And just for the aficionados, these don't seem to be direction selective cells. Whereas for the dorsal retina, you have this huge peak over here. Basically, this is the streak that I was telling you before. And so <clears throat> somehow, we can think about this as, okay, this is important such that you, you somehow compensate for changes in the statistics of natural scene, or you, you have some new emergent properties. And I have no idea um, how to interpret that. 
but um, it, it, for myself, it makes me wonder to what extent, um, and this would be nice to have a discussion, um, this global changes in asymmetry that seem to match some, um, some efficient coding framework might have influence in how this cells actually encode information. And um, last but not least, um, some of the early works of um, um, response property in the superior colliculus um, that we have been trying to match basically the, from Drager and Hubel basically say that you would have um, um, a very strong upward bias in, in, in the superior colliculus. These are cells that were actually recorded from from, from um, inputs that are located uh, positioned towards the horizon. So these cells that are responsible because of how they were doing the experiments. So perhaps you have this very strong um, um, bias because you also have this very strong asymmetry in, in the visual system, such that when you record for that, you all, and, and, and you re reconstruct the uh, spatial temporal filters of colloquial neurons in that position, you see something very similar. You see this um, 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 asymmetry that is more on the upper field of you. So to summarize what I've been telling you so far is that um, <clears throat> the global architecture of um, receptive fields in retina um, matches what we expect from some efficient from our efficient coding framework. Basically, depending on what you expect from a signal to noise level, a natural statistic at photopic levels, you will see some differences in the receptive field structure. You can see that in the model and you can see that in vivo. And um, this is basically what I've told you so far. We, um, in this work, um, Victor Milaski implemented this normative model and expanded on the predictive coding framework such that um, we could um, have three different predictions of center sizes, center surrounds, um, and, that, um, and the relative strengths of center surrounds, and also on, um, on the asymmetry on, on, on the horizon. We develop a new method that I think would be very useful for many um, questions. It is very cheap. Um, the first time I implemented it, it costed me 500 bucks. And um, if you want to do it fancy, it will cost you, let's say, an, an order of an order of magnitude a little more than that. Um, and and it's very robust and um, allows you to have a lot of data for 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 for, for um, um, very for the effort of doing it. And <clears throat> we use that system and verified our, our model. And basically, it seems to be um, that qualitatively all prediction matches. Um, and um, at the end, we see that also that this goes through all um, ganglion cell types, at least as we um, um, cluster them. And, um, and here, I would just like to open the discussion of what it actually means if you have gradients of um, that change and in a way that might influence the way they are encoding the, the, the natural scene. And um, the take home summary is basically that the retina um, um, implemented some graded uh, sunglasses such that um, in the upper piece of view, you have um, um, a stronger surround you basically, um, 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 whereas in the um, um, lower field of view, um, you don't. And the last thing, I have to thank many people um, that um, have worked in, in this um, project, particularly, I mean, um, Divyanch, Olga, Victor, and Jan, who did the work. Um, the entire lab and the old members of the lab, um, we have been here, the lab is now five years old and now it's starting to be, uh, um, uh, to, to, to give um, real outputs. So I hope um, you like the work we're doing. And of course, um, thank you for all the people that supported us financially, ISD and, and many other um, um, granting um, um, foundations. So this said, um, um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you a lot, Maximilian. That was very interesting technique and result you got here. Particularly interesting this trick you got from a, on a vertical axis. Um, I just like to remind the audience that if they want to join us on this room and interact, ask questions, participate with discussions, the link is, um, is on the chat. So I actually have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you had a lot of spam today. Let me just give me a minute to find it. Uh, I saw a discussion about uh, UV cones between Marla Feller and Anna Vlasic. Hello, you two, by the way. 
Um, yeah, so we're talking about UV cones, uh, your stimulation about UV cones. Um, so Anna was saying that uh, she was curious about whether you have thought about whether UV on the stimulus affects the properties of the receptive field you collect. Um, if we use only UV stimulus, if it would change the properties, then if we would be using green stimulus. Um, green, that's the question, I think. If it and so, change, yeah. so of course, I mean, some of, some of the properties will, will, will change. That's for clear. I mean, the best example is GRGC, where you have, let's say, a green surround and a UV center in some part of the receptive field. So um, this is not the, the ultimate truth of how the receptive field will look like, and it will change depending on the light level and, um, and spectrum that you use. Unfortunately, we cannot um, um, use green stimulus right now. We, we, we are testing with synthetic dyes to shift it a little bit more to the red. And in theory, um, we could actually see green in our calculation. The problem is that um, it's, a, it's a stimulus contrast issue. So uh, depending on the light that we use, the stimulus contrast is too weak. And if we increase the stimulus contrast, we have too much bleed through, just the technicality. Um, but I think that in general, I, um, the, yeah. I think that in general, no, I was uh, saying that you're... okay. Um, Go ahead. Sorry, I have it. Again. <clears throat> I think that in general, um, um, the predictions that we did, we also did for the UV channel. Um, so basic, but for um, green, they would be very similar, and um, it could be that um, on on a general terms, I mean, if you think of GRGCs, their their surround would be asymmetric and would be also positioned eventually. So this is an indication, at least some of the cells will have similar properties in the symmetry and pointing um, contrary to what you would expect. And, um, and from, from the distribution of cones um, and green cones. And, um, and if green cones and rods would be simultaneously active, which there is evidence for that, um, perhaps it is a method where the UV will give you like a, a, an actual DC. So like green, even if, if green would be symmetric, if you only have the symmetric receptive field with green stimulus, you will add the, the asymmetry that comes from the UV and perhaps that will um, 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 make the difference. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm explaining myself well, but um, basically I don't know um, to what extent at this level it will change. Um, my impression is that um, um, it will, um, but everything points towards that um, for, for what we, how we think about it, it might not matter much for our conclusions. Well, I think that answers a follow-up question from Anna. I mean, we have Marla and Hannah on the chat if you want to follow up on this question. Hello, sorry, there's a little bit of background noise, but I, I, I could follow up a little bit. Um, I'm sorry, there was a time difference, so I missed the beginning of your answer to the question. Um, but my, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, because there, there is a lot of work showing that the receptive fields can be color specific in different regions of the retina. Mm -hmm. And so if we're in the dorsal retina where green is the dominant uh, photoreceptor, and then also you're not really stimulating the rods very strongly with the stimulus, how can you say mm -hmm. that the properties of the receptive fields that you find are sort of the, the overall receptive field property? Without, no, 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 I'm not, uh, I mean, I'm first, I'm, 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 it's one of the pictures that we, so first, I don't think, I, I did the word where I basically show that it is important to, to look at the difference between green and UV and that that might change the receptive field. That's for sure, I cannot, I mean, this, this is clear. Um, this is not the ultimate truth um, because we don't have green and there is it is impossible to do this work while having the green right now. I mean, we would love to do it, but at the scale that we're doing it, it's not possible. Um, I think that um, generally, if you think of a, a system where um, green, um, and rods, uh, green cones and rods will be active, um, if you bunch them together, you will have basically a uniform um, um, input across the, um, across, the, the, across the retina. So one way of thinking of it is that um, even if 
there is no asymmetry difference because um, um, now we think of the mechanism being the UV cones. If it would be basically uniformly spread across the entire retina, assuming that this is the case and assuming that and that will have as an effect that most of the green response would be symmetric, the UV might break that symmetry and the, the UV might make it, make it still stronger and weaker um, to, to the UV to the UV channel and everything we, we optimize is to, um, to our UV, um, to the UV input that people have measured. Again, if you use UV or if you use green, it's basically the same. So um, I would love to know, but um, that is um, technically not possible right now. Yeah, it's really cool data though, to see, especially seeing the like the DS tuning across the whole, um, distribution just in one retina. That was really neat. Um, we have Michael who would like to ask a question. If you want to go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah hey, Max. Um, it was Hello. very um, clever and totally convincing. Um, it was very impressive. So I have a qu I don't really, I have a hard time thinking about the trade-offs um, for the actual animal, right? So as you know, Eyes can move, the head can move, and as far as I know, the world is not flat, right? And so you could imagine that um, like overplaying this optimality for the average case is actually maladaptive, right? So I'm wondering if your analysis, one question is, do you find the animals are actually, or the retinas are not fully optimized, right? As your theory predicts, and they sit kind of one step below, mm -hmm. right? Uh, really pushing for this global maximum. Alternatively, um, you know, maybe you can speculate about some kind of dynamic compensation. Like, do you think you have to reweight all the outputs of RGCs if you tip your head a little bit or if you're on a crooked surface? That would be fascinating. What do you so, think is going so on? I, I, so if you, there's a new paper from the Care Lab that came out just recently, I think it's in eLife, and they're basically looking at how the animal stabilizes um, the eyes. Um, and it's remarkable how well the horizon is basically stabilized all, all over. Right. So it's in a lab. It, it's in a lab, right? It's just like on hunting, hunting. A, it's in a lab. It's while hunting, a, but a buck. But um, I think there are at least mechanisms to compensate. I don't say that um, um, eye movements are are there to compensate such the horizon stays at the same position. I don't know, but there is a lot of uh, stabilization going on there. And as far as I I, I think, if on average the um, the the horizon is basically kept there, you don't need to. Um, um, have a perfect match to, to increase optimality. But this is a very difficult question to ask um, because we don't know, I, we haven't looked at when this would break. And of course, at some point it will, uh, it will not be optimal anymore. Um, um, but if the horizon stays, uh, seeing what the animal does, and at least in this lab conditions with the cameras on the head, so that you can basically see what the eyes are doing, um, it seems to be that, um, the movements of the eye with respect of how the animal shakes and runs around, they're, they're, they're highly um, stabilizing them such that they are looking at basically a particular position, which would improve at least um, um, such an efficiency um, um, constraint that we are imposing. Okay. Yeah. No, no it's just, it just, it's, it's interesting, right? Because it just means that, right, the, you can't ignore the behavioral side of it, right? That the, that the behaviors have to sort of clamp, right, mm -hmm. um, the visual system in a way that you can actually take advantage of all of these trade-offs, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And I mean, to what extent that actually improves, let's say, because all efficiency arguments are energetic cost arguments. And so to what extent actually the system is improving calories or something like that, it's a very difficult question to ask. And, and then you, I don't know, it, we, we can estimate it, but I think it would be kind of like um, um, not really accurate. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mike. Okay, uh, let's continue. We have quite a few interesting questions, uh, so I will jump to the next one. Uh, I have one from Inesh. I mean, she's here with with us. If you want to ask it yourself. Yes. Hi. Thanks uh, for a nice talk, Max. Um, I, I I want to ask, and thanks for for uh, letting me ask myself. I it was a question about uh, so you have looked at a lot of cells. And, and, and presumably a lot of stimuli as well, because one hour and a half of, of, a, of a stimulation. Um, do any uh, properties of the spatial or temporal properties of the sensor surround 
that you've observed? Do they predict any specific um, se um, tuning property to certain stimuli? Okay. You know, I mean, I don't know. Now you, I see that you only look at UV, but that would be a good. So, I mean, um, these are very nice questions. And there is a master student who, which is starting to will use the data to see to what extent we can predict with this spatial temporal receptive field any of the response properties. And no, we haven't. And we don't record for one hour and a half. This was just like at the beginning when we we're trying to see, like push the system. And we could record for an hour, an hour and a half maximum of, of one region, but normally we record, let's say 20 minutes because let's say 15 minutes of white noise and then some chirp response is on. And then we move to the next the next area because we want to tile the um, the retina. So it's, 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 it's a good system, but we cannot, I mean, it has its limits also in how long we can record. And, um, but yeah, it's a very interesting question. And um, we would right now try to exactly ask that. See, we have, I don't know, a few thousand um, chirp responses we have for all of them receptive fields. To what extent, what, what should we do to basically be able to predict one from the other and to what extent we can do that? So hopefully we'll know soon. Yeah, it's interesting, very interesting, thanks. Good morning, Max. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm good. Sorry, I'm just waking up and groggy and can't speak. And uh, but while going through the uh, part of the talk, I was wondering you talked emphasized the spatial filters. What about the temporal filters? Do they change uh, in the same way? And we, you know? we they don't see, at least the centers and this, no, not really. They don't change um, um, in in the same way. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to use them to cluster them. So we have, if you look at all the, our temporal clusters, they're somehow uniformly represented across um, um, elevation. And so we don't, we don't see that they adapt. So is, is that expected or not based on your predictive coding hypothesis? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't ask um, that particular specifically, but you would expect that there would also be some adaptations in the temporal domain. If um, and at least if I remember correctly, yes, um, we don't see that, but we also didn't look at it in, in in much detail so far. I mean, mechanistically, you might expect those to be linked, right, or not, or maybe it'll give you insights into the mechanisms that are generating those surrounds. I mean, if there are, I mean, normally things and as you tighten in space, you'll tighten in time as well, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, maybe Tom, you can, or anyone else, uh, the fly guys can tell us what happens elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. No? Perhaps if we, if we add the green, then they tighten in time. Okay. And okay. Maybe, okay. Okay. I don't have an answer. I have a question actually for retina people, speaking of mechanisms of um, center surround receptive fields, is there a consensus, um, like that actually accounts for a proper sort of circuit architecture, right? Do, do we have good evidence that really explains how a center surround receptive field comes about? Or, I mean, I've seen the cartoons. I, I just mean, how does the data and the connectomic work and the neuroanatomy actually line up with that? I mean, I mean, yes and no. So yes, because we know horizontal cells are useful and amacrine cells are useful and it all makes sense, but what hasn't really been addressed is the fact that you're going to get layers of center of ruts around, right? So it's kind of you're putting rings into rings into rings. And how that is a good thing or a bad thing, I don't think has been looked at much. I don't know. Are you guys going to, any thoughts on that? In there, no, this is what I was alluding to with those different uh, mechanisms of surround. Some might aim the, the temporal and some might aim the spatial parts of it. And maybe you can disentangle it that way. Because to me, it's surprising otherwise that you can have uh, you know, this gradient of spatial filters and not change the temporal tuning properties. But again. So, uh, so, so one other thing is that we're looking at calcium, no? And so it could be that there is some. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be that um, calcium, yeah. calcium responses are not, even yeah, though yeah, we, yeah. We, we have relatively fast filters, it might yeah. be that we, we, we won't be able to see it um, because the change might be much bigger. Yeah, yeah, I think that's possible, but I, I bet it's you difficult. won't see it, right? Because if you if you measure a fast slow fast process with a long pass filter, if you measure it nice enough, it'll just you know in a in a systematic manner go longer. That makes sense. So you know, like we can tell apart a fast from a slow cell even at calcium quite happily, right? It's just both of them are really slow. It's just one is even slower than the other. 
Right, but to tell a gradient across the retina might be pretty challenging of a certain type, right? Maybe, maybe. Actually, maybe. you might see it in the chirps before you see it in the kernels. Yeah. No, but otherwise it's an amazing technique. Yeah. I, actually, actually um, we've been, um, Victor has been looking at this in a very systematic way. And um, he sees um, very, when you trying to cluster the chirps based on position and based on response property together, he sees suddenly um, systematic changes that you won't see if you let came in cluster because they're very, sl very slight. Perhaps they're exactly that what, what we're seeing that in the ventral retina that might be might be a little faster or have a little discomponent. But if you average in the, you, it's very, if you don't take the spatial contribution at the component into account, it's very difficult to, to, to put them together. Perhaps we are already seeing that. So when I schedule, let's try to follow up. Uh, I was about to ask Marion's question, but she just joined us. Yeah, I decided to come online as well, yeah. Max. <laughs> I mean, it's related to the conversation that you guys were already having. If there are other properties of uh, receptive fields that change um, across uh, space, um, especially because uh, there were so many um, receptive fields that you showed in this like zoo of receptive fields that really were in center surround, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, there there are some that look basically um, a perfect abor and reproduce. It's not just one cell, so there are lots yeah. of. And so, yes, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to unpack here, um, but um, you, we do one unpacking after the other. And, um, and to what extent you can use basically the entire spatial temporal receptive field somehow to, 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 to define that would be perhaps the next question to ask. And, and there is a lot of things happening in there. And, and it's now we're basically looking at the, the static view of the basic spatial um, filter. But of course, it's also a dynamic view, which where the surround might come in, move in one direction, the other, and, and others might be more static, where the surrounds always staying in one particular space and all that we see. And these Gabor-like receptive fields, is this something that you specifically pull out with the stimulus that you are using to map them? No, I mean, you can, you can see that. I mean, I, am I still presenting my... Uh, I have to reshare. I have to reshare. Uh, okay, let me see if I go back to this slide. So if you look over here, number two, it somehow looks like that, but with the bigger receptive fields, it's, and then we look at the small receptive fields, like classically, you, um, you see something and it becomes much, much nicer once you use the new stimulus, which works very nicely. And actually I have to say that yesterday I saw a paper published um, um, de describing completely separately to us, um, but more from a theoretical perspective, this receptive field um, method um, where they call it super resolution mapping of receptive fields. And, and basically it really works. <laughs> it also works for um, supercoliculus and cortex and whatever you want. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, I, I think they've also implemented this in, in time. So you kind of shift the temporal properties of the stimulus and the measure the response and you can get high resolution, temporal, high temporal resolution as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. See our temporal resolution. Let me see. Where is it? Here. So, um, yeah, it is kind of slow, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, so the next question is: uh, Can you use these techniques for glue sniffer imaging? <laughs> Do we have new glue sniffers that mm -hmm. might match? Uh, I mean, um, we're using a, a, I assume so. Um, I think um, the, the, the difficult thing is to, if you wanna have, um, with glue sniffers, you would like to have it more sparsely um, and um, such that you don't have, a, I mean, or zoom in bigger, um, like, have, um, but I mean, if there are response properties that you can image, if, if I think if there are lots of different buttons at different positions, you might, it might be blurry. So that is perhaps a disadvantage, but um, if so, if you are sparse enough, then yes, for sure. A bit too green, no? Need a rectal sniffer. 
I think it will work on green with UV2. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I, I don't think that this is um, the, uh, it, you will see responses just because the, you will saturate um, the green path. But here, I don't think we're saturating it, but we cannot get response because we, the, our contrast in the green channels is just too weak. It's like 4% calculated. And if you put it bigger, we have a very strong bleed through, so then we cannot use it anymore. But um, I mean, for, for ganglions and reporting, it's really well. <laughs> Uh, before we continue, uh, because it's been an hour already, um, I'd just like to tell our audience that is still live on YouTube that we will soon close the stream. So if you want to continue this discussion and join us, uh, you can still do so um, on the link, which is currently on the chat, if you want to come and discuss. Uh, so after this short question, I will stop the, the YouTube stream. Um, what I suggest, because there's a lot of questions that we can still discuss, but uh, Tom Baden suggested a discussion regarding spatial temporal asymmetries. Do you want to bring that yeah, up? Yeah, so Gao Tom has, has since uh, deliberated on that, um, but I can just steal away Lee's question, um, which was about, um, well, you can you can manipulate the mouse to be less asymmetric with the, with the opsin gradient at least, right? Either with genetically or by giving it some, by taking away thyroid hormone, I guess, messing with hormones. So imagine you now take your mouse, which is super asymmetric and you force it to be symmetric developmentally. Would you expect that to give you symmetric receptive fields or do you think that's a different property? Um, I mean, there is this albino mouse, which basically have no gradient. And ideally you could basically test that by, by crossing them or back crossing all of the, the lines to, to, and yes, I mean, that would be my prediction that um, it becomes less symmetric and, um, and um, that would be a nice way of, of, of testing that hypothesis. Um, what the benefits are for a mouse, I think it's very difficult to, to test that behaviorally. Um, if this is the next question you might ask, I mean, if it's a, um, is a mouse without a grading more um, coping better in a natural environment? Not. I mean, these, these questions are very difficult to address. But um, I, I would assume, at least from a physiological level, that the, the that this asymmetry might might not be there anymore. But I might be wrong. There, there could be other mechanisms that that are important. Perhaps. I mean, there's a gradient of synaptic strength that, um, and it's just that we think of the the um, opsin grading as being the the a direct obvious link. Mm. I mean, it, it must be quite hardwired, right? Because these are the poor mice sitting in some cage somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's not like they've ever seen a horizon. Exactly. So, yeah. Horizon. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so we will close this uh, discussion now. Uh, see you all next week for another talk. I am now closing the live stream and I'm consigning my moderator right to you all. Please continue. Thank you. And we are.